I would have to say that if you wanted to describe this year, if you were looking for the cover of Time Magazine, Person of the Year, it would have to be the year of the migrant. Unfortunately for a lot of the wrong reasons, but nonetheless. So far, the year 2015 has been, in every sense of the word, the year of the migrant. Migration has dominated the headlines and many of the major meetings, including the UN General Assembly. And you will find in Annex 1 a report on the references made to migration during the high-level meetings at the United Nations this year. Record numbers of migrants and refugees are entering Europe, and this made migration a defining issue of the year. Human mobility, however, is a large-scale phenomenon. It goes far beyond the Mediterranean. I guess that's why I'm so pleased to welcome these observers from the Indian Ocean and the Caribbean, etc. It covers the Red Sea, the Indian Ocean, the Bay of Bengal, the uh, Andaman Sea, uh, the straits between Haiti and South Florida, the Mexican-U.S. Uh, border, and the deserts of the world. It is a global phenomenon uh, on a scale seldom witnessed before, and we are all divided in the international community on how to deal with it, how to respond to it. So unfortunately, much of the mobility is not voluntary. We have unprecedented, simultaneous, and complex humanitarian emergencies from West Africa into the Himalayas, uh, driven by a myriad of forces, including conflicts in all these regions, natural and man-made disasters, abject poverty, lack of opportunity, violence, and persistent human rights abuses, and then climate change. So we are in a period unlike any other that certainly I have known, unprecedented numbers of people on the move, unprecedented forced migration, unprecedented armed conflicts with little prospect of resolution of any of them, uh, unprecedented political malaise with a vacuum where political leadership and courage would be required, serious erosion of international moral authority and violation of international human rights and humanitarian law on all sides, shifting power relationships, and increasing anti-migrant sentiment and policy. So we have a lot of work to do. Level three emergencies. Uh, at one point in this past year, IOM was responding with its partners to six level three emergencies. The ongoing system-wide level three status in the Syrian Arab Republic, Iraq, South Sudan, the declaration of a level three emergency in Yemen, the level three emergency in the Central African Republic, deactivated in June, and the internal level three that we declared to respond to the Ebola crisis, which was deactivated only in November. In addition, your organization dispatched rapid response staff and provided assistance for level two emergencies such as the ongoing instability uh, in Nigeria and Ukraine and the natural disasters that took place in Vanuatu, the tropical cyclone Pam, and in Nepal, uh, the earthquake. With my senior management team, we continue to be active in all of the major forums and venues at which migration is the subject of discussion. Uh, owing largely to the glowing of the growing public interest in migration and the activity of IOM staff, we are gaining greater visibility, recognition, and media coverage more than at any other time in our nearly 65-year history. The current migration debate is largely one-sided, with emphasis on the short-term, strong security focus driven by mounting fears, which we're not addressing very well, and negative stereotypes, which are destructive, including particularly as a result of the recent terrorist attacks in different parts of the world, including Paris. As such, the positive historical and current contributions of migrants are being lost, leading to an unbalanced and harmful negative public discourse. So due diligence, due diligence is required if we're going to make the link 
between the historic concern for refugees and migrants on the one hand and the critical role they will play in an aging industrialized global north on the other hand. Migration in all forms. The trends that marked the past year brought migration to the fore in international discussions and negotiations. For example, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, adopted by the UN General Assembly in September, refers to migration or migrants in four of the targets contained in the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. This was a breakthrough rectifying the large vacuum that was left by the Millennium Development Goals, which were silent both on migration and population displacement. There again, in Annex 2 of my report, you will see migration's relevance for realizing the SDGs. Among other things, the 2030 Agenda recognizes, first of all, the development contribution of migration, the importance of facilitating safe, legal, and orderly migration, including through planned and well-managed migration policies, and the importance of ensuring full respect for human rights and the humane treatment of migrants, regardless of their migration status, of refugees and of displaced persons. So migration and disaster-induced human mobility also feature in the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction in its 2015-2030 program that was agreed to in Sendai, Japan in March last year. This is a topic that's also expected to play a role at the 21st session of the Conference on Climate Change in Paris, COP21, next month. For our, we were at both of those meetings, and we've been at the one, we'll be at the other one. For its part, IOM held its own conference, global conference on migrants and cities here in Geneva in October, and we made migrants and cities the theme of our flagship publication, the World Migration Report, to underscore the overwhelmingly urban nature of international and domestic migration. This conference brought together local authorities, central governments, and relevant national and international actors to look at the link between migrants and cities and the key role that local authorities play. We had about 600 people taking part in that conference. Migration also received further attention during the UN General Assembly, where the Secretary General held the first ever side event on migration. More recently, the European Union and the African Union, of course, along with their partners, came together for a summit on migration at Valletta, Malta, which was also a first and which I was also able to attend. The second part of my presentation has to do with the organization itself, the state of IOM. Uh, there are, first of all, what I call the three C's that I announced when I was re-elected in 2013. Uh, first of all, under the banner of continuity, coherence, and change, we are working single-mindedly to address the foregoing global migration trends. First of all, continuity. Policies. A range of internal policies were either revised or updated or created anew, afresh, in order to maintain our position as the Global Migration Agency, not just as an operational agency, but an agency on the cutting edge of policy. These included policies on humanitarian action, gender, and protection. We finalized the humanitarian policy called the Principles for Humanitarian Action. This is a, a policy that aims to strengthen our global humanitarian role. These were presented at the Standing Committee on Programs and Finance and were welcomed by the membership. Furthermore, we developed a new gender equality policy, which serves as an update to the 1995 policy focuses on gender equality rather than focusing only on one gender. The new policy on protection replaced a 1997 version. It focuses on our internal processes to ensure and to implement its supported protection mandate and to ensure a rights-based approach 
in all our activities. We also had, uh, thanks to very hard work of our current chair as chairman of the Budget Reform Committee, uh, a budget strengthening plan, a three-year plan, and the financial year 2016 will be the last year of that three-year plan. Uh, that was approved in 2013. And I'm pleased to note that we have made great progress in strengthening key functions, benefiting from the combined 12% increase in assessed contributions over three years, 4% each year, and the increase in the project overhead rate from 5% to 7%. By the end of the, we have been able, I think, to improve management, oversight, and the implementation of our mandate. So by the end of this three-year process, which is coming to an end fairly soon, we believe that we will have strengthened the core staffing significantly with the number of previously overstretched functions significantly building their internal capacity. And there is a report uh, in my uh, uh, larger report that will give you exactly how this money was spent. It, it included delocalization by placing staff in low-cost locations. It included economy air travel for all staff, including myself, and recruitment of local staff rather than more expensive international staff. In line with the plan's emphasis on alternative funding resources, we are pleased to report that as of September 2015, you, our member states, have seconded 20 persons to help us uh, in the administration. On internal controls, I want to thank all of you for your generosity in approving the three-year budget strengthening plan. Um, we've been able with that to improve internal controls. We've also been able to augment staffing and capacity in the Office of Legal Affairs, the Office of the Inspector General, Human Resources Management Division. Uh, we've also hired, uh, recruited a risk management officer, and we're presently working on introducing a comprehensive risk management framework to give us a more systematic approach to identifying risk within the organization. Now, although we are not part of the United Nations system. IOM continues to play a key role in the UN system-wide initiatives, both on the prevention of sexual exploitation and sexual abuse, but also in sexual and gender-based violence, SGBV. For four years now, I have been the designated UN system champion on PSEA and SGBV. I'm also very pleased and proud to be among International Geneva Gender Champions, which is an initiative of the United Nations Office in Geneva and the permanent mission of the United States of America and its partners. These issues receive high priority at IOM, receive my personal attention, especially in emergency settings where women and children are particularly vulnerable. We're leading a team of experts from the UN non-governmental organizations and international organizations trying to develop standard operating procedures for handling joint complaints and for case referrals. Another project, Migrants in Countries in Crisis. The government-led initiative, MICHIC, co-chaired by the Philippines and the United States, for which we are the Secretariat, is well underway. We've established the Secretariat with funding from the United States and the backing of the MICHIC Working Group. Broad consultation with government, civil society organizations, the private sector, and partner international organizations have helped us to pick up the pace with a view to developing by mid-year 2016 principles, guidelines, and effective practices for one and all on the pre-crisis and emergency and post-crisis phases. We're increasingly proving to be a solid example of how inclusive multi-staker dialogue can lead to the development of practical guidance for states. Regional consultative processes on migration, a very important one. We now have 18 regional consultative processes covering every area in the world with one exception, 
Caribbean. And we're working on that one. For most of these, IOM serves as the secretary. Uh, we're now covering, as I say, the globe. And we're pleased to have been able to work with the League of Arab States to help it set up its own regional consultative process, RCP. And immediately, the newly established Arab regional consultative process offered to host this year's fifth global meeting of the chairs and secretariats of all regional consultative processes throughout the world. We met in Cairo in October, and I'm very grateful uh, to the Arab RCP for that. Um, RCPs continue to play an important role in bringing us together on common uh, concerns for countries of origin, transit, and destination. Resettlement and movement management. This was the reason, the raison d'etre for IOM's founding in 1951, and we're still at it. It is still the very heart and soul of what we do on the operational side. And it's gotten much, much larger and much, much busier given the movements, the force movements that we have. All right, we continue to grow in complexity and scope. In 2015, IOM completed or is undertaking resettlement, return, or evacu evacuation operations from several locations with high security risks. For example, since the beginning of the Yemen crisis, we've assisted more than 2,000 migrants by air and evacuated 12,000 by sea with Omer transportation from Djibouti and Somalia to other areas of origin. We expect by the end of the year to have moved around 120,000 persons under these schemes. Emergency preparedness and response. We have responded to every major conflict and crisis in the world this year. Emergencies now constitute the single largest portion of our operational budget and the greatest single reason for the expansion of our worldwide staff. As mentioned, we are evacuating migrant workers and others from Yemen by sea and air. We are providing assistance with 300 staff inside Syria to the IDPs. We're rebuilding our programs in the backdrop of the conflict in the Central African Republic after our offices were burned down. We're still there. We're going to stay there playing a major role in protecting tens of thousands of persons fleeing violence in South Sudan, assistance to refugees uh, and others in Burundi, providing life-saving support in Iraq and other conflict-ridden countries. We're engaged in responding to natural disasters, including the earthquake in Nepal and other slow onset calamities in the Sahel. We've undertaken emergency and preparedness activities in 50 different countries, including the areas of camp coordination, camp management, displacement tracking, emergency shelter, non-food items, protection, water, sanitation, hygiene. Our largest humanitarian operation continues to be in South Sudan, where we lead the emergency shelter and CCCM clusters. In Syria, Syria more than 7.5 million individuals are displaced and we've reached more than half of those through a team of nearly 300 staff members uh, elsewhere, both in Damascus, Jordan, and Turkey, and in Iraq, where 3.2 million people are displaced. Uh, transition and recovery. Over the course of 2015, our transition and recovery program covered 32 countries. Ongoing initiatives in Afghanistan, Chad, Central African Republic, Niger, Somalia, Yemen, and stabilization, stabilization initiatives in Haiti, Iraq, and Peru. Displacement tracking matrix. IOM continues to deploy the DTM in all humanitarian response operations. We're active in 22 countries, tracking and monitoring some 15 million internally displaced persons. And by the way, the DTM is widely used now by many of the UN agencies. Capacity building in emergencies, continuing to strengthen our capacity to prepare for and respond to crises. We've trained now 10,000 individuals in the areas of CCCM 
displacement tracking, and prevention of gender-based violence. We're also supporting governments to ensure safe, orderly, dignified, and humane migration by supporting them in migration management through several thematic areas, including immigration and border management, facilitated migration service, labor, mobility, and human development, migration assistance, mi migration environment and climate change, and migration health. And there will be a special panel on migration health uh, later this week. Uh, in 2015, our focus was strengthened in the areas of countering migrant smuggling, border security. In terms of facilitated migration services, as of November this year, we had 64 active projects to support well-administered visa and entry schemes, including the establishment of administrative visa processing centers, identity checks, and biometrics enrollment, document verification services, visa application tracking, and travel assistance. From January through October, we gave voluntary travel assistance to more than 14,000 migrants traveling primarily under family reunification visa schemes, including to Australia, Canada, and the United States. Labor mobility and human development. We continue to work on the promotion of ethical recruitment practices and transparency in labor supply chains. We've gotten very good initial funding from the Swiss Agency for Development and, and, and Cooperation in order to establish an international recruitment integrity system for a period of three years. This is focusing on developing a certification system for recruitment intermediaries and pilot testing in several selected migration corridors and to develop an independent governance structure. Additional funding for the development of IRIS was received in 2015 also from the governments of Sweden and Canada. Migrant assistance. We gave direct assistance to nearly 12,000 victims of human trafficking this year and associated forms of exploitation. We've assisted a further 300 migrants in need through the Global Assistance Fund. In June, we launched the crowdfunding platform sixdegree.org, which provides public with a direct way to help individual survivors of trafficking. We've received 68 donors registered on the portal. And we also continue to give various forms of voluntary return and re reintegration assistance uh, to migrants. Migration, the environment and climate change. First of January this year, we created a new division, the Migration, Environment and Climate Change Division, establishing and strengthened our external positioning on this cross-cutting topic. It also enhanced our in-house capacity and clarified our internal responsibilities. Another policy process in 2015 was the contribution that IOM made to the Nansen Initiative as a standing invitee of the steering group, a member of the consultative committee, and a member of the group of friends. We also co-organized the Nansen Initiative South Asia Regional Consultation in Bangladesh. Under the European funded, EU funded migration, environment, and climate change uh, project, uh, we were able to train 59 local researchers to conduct household survey surveys in four pilot countries. Uh, we hope to be active at Paris COP21, and we have a side event for that. Uh, we're also going to inaugurate there, introduce the Atlas of environmental migration. A quick word on uh, migrant health. Health aspects of migration and human mobility have emerged as a growing concern for states and humanitarian and development actors. We've consistently expanded and improved and diversified our health and migration services to respond to new challenges. Some 300,000 migrants, including 100,000 refugees, have benefited from our health assessment program this year. We have 1,200 of our 9,000 staff are in the migrant health area. Uh, our, we did a lot for our relationship in 2015 through our response to the Ebola outbreak. Guided by the Migration Crisis Operational Framework, 
we responded quickly to the operation of setting up, uh, recruiting, staffing, and managing three Ebola treatment units in Liberia and the deployment of foreign medical teams. We gave support to 28 prefectural emergency operation centers in Guinea, and we trained 8,200 frontline responders in infection prevention and control at the Sierra Leone Ebola Training Academy, which we ran at the request of DFID in the UK. The IOM Development Fund continues to support joint member state IOM projects. It's about the only actual uh, development money that the IOM has, and I want to thank all of you for your generous donations. It stands at about eight and a half million dollars now. We'd hope to get above the 10 million uh, mark, but we haven't done it up to now. But thank you for the support you are giving us. We did 53 projects by the end of the year, budgets ranging from small projects of 42,000 up to 300,000. The fund now has more than a, a 110 active projects covering a range of migration areas. Uh, and as the number of states increase in my OM, so do the number of requests for use of that money. So I hope in view of the increasing requests that more of you will see fit to provide voluntary contributions to this important fund. Under coherence, partnerships, we've established a dedicated outreach with two particular groups of partners, parliamentarians and local authorities. We recognize we simply have to do more to support you by meeting with your parliaments. And at any point where we can be helpful in that regard, we want to be. The same goes for mayors and local authorities. We have to do more there, and we want to play a key role in policy making in helping to influence public opinion in order to counter xenophobia and anti-migrant sentiment. And the connection that is now being made by some between migration and, and terrorism. Local authorities, uh, as we know from our World Migration Report, uh, are the most closely attuned to the needs of migrants. Uh, so we want to stay in closer touch. The Migration Governance Framework, which you have a document on, is therefore a very timely and useful contribution to managing migration and human mobility. In this framework, uh, we've brought together issues from very diverse policy areas, including economic and social development, rights and institutional frameworks, and issues relevant in both the development and humanitarian spheres. Furthermore, we remain very active in the Interagency Standing Committee Humanitarian Response, the Global Migration Group, the Global Formal Migration and Development, the United Nations Alliance of Civilizations, and other relevant forums. The Quartet, just a brief mention of this. In view of the current Mediterranean migration situation, which requires concerted leadership, there's been a kind of an informal quartet of senior leaders who've been developing together joint messaging and approaches that focus on several multilateral partners, including the European Union. This quartet consists of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees and Human Rights, Special Representative of the UN Secretary General for Migration and Development, and the IOM Director General. We developed on our own, in addition to that, an IOM response plan for the Mediterranean and beyond that was updated as recently as last month. Uh, we have, there are 150 activities in 40 countries in that particular response plan. Heretofore, we've been invited to take part in all United Nations country teams in the 160 countries in which IOM has offices. And we've been participants in almost all of the UN multi-donor trust funds. Country team participation helps us to bring migration and human mobility to the UN country level planning. Unfortunately, there's been the issuance of an official United Nations Development Operations Coordination Office document earlier this year relating to IOM's non-UN status that may limit our ability to take part in the country teams and the trust funds in the future. And that will be the subject of further conversation when we get to the IOM-UN relationship um, 
Just a few words on IMU and relations. There's a member state working group that you all founded two years ago on IOMU and relations and the IOM 12-point strategy. This has met throughout the year under the able chairmanship uh, of our just elected chairman of the council. In addition, I have held five separate meetings over this past year with the Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations in New York to talk about that relationship and what, what it might be in the future. The outcome of the working group's deliberations, which have been informed by my discussions in New York, is a draft resolution for your consideration at this session of the Council. If approved, the whole idea is that the resolution would request me to approach the United Nations formally to discuss how the relationship between IOM and the UN could be improved based on what we call essential elements, it's an essential elements document on which the resolution is based, uh, what, what could it be? And I will come back to you at regular intervals. I will keep you informed if this is approved through regular reports to the working group, which all of you uh, are welcome to participate in. Coming to the end now, apologize for the length. Initiatives. We have launched and continue to launch a very wide range of initiatives. In Annex 3 to my report, you will see emerging and ongoing initiatives. There are more than 30 of them. Some of them emanate from the outcome document of the UN second, the UN General Assembly's second uh, uh, high-level dialogue on migration and development in October 2013 an initiative on lowering the cost of remittance transfers, the Irish project I mentioned earlier, the Migration Policy Advisory Board, the Migration Governance Framework, and the government-led MITCHIC initiative for which we are the Secretariat. If requested to approach the UN formally, I'll keep you closely informed and will give you then an opportunity to decide yourself on the next steps they wish to take while keeping all options on the table. Uh, I mentioned already the DOCO document and the concern that we have about that. In any case, my idea would be probably to call for a special council meeting in late June, early July uh, to discuss what we've been able to uh, come up with in my discussions in New York and through the working group. Uh, a word on the private sector partnership strategy. This has been one of my principal institutional priorities, partnerships, and I've asked the, director, uh, the Deputy Director General to lead the development of our private sector partnership strategy to make sure that we have a solid basis and a clear vision to engage effectively with businesses, foundations, high net worth individuals, and the general public. This strategy was presented at the 17th session of the SEPF. It's well received and I'm very grateful to the strong support that many of you have expressed for this strategy. I'm truly grateful to the Deputy Director General and her dedicated team of colleagues from headquarters and many field offices for having developed what I think is a solid, comprehensive private sector partnership strategy. So this is a significant achievement, but it's only the first step. A critical element for the successful implementation of the strategy will be the financial support of IOM member states. It has to be your strategy too. Compared to other agencies, our funding requirements for private sector engagement are relatively modest. Nevertheless, they are absolutely crucial for IOM to succeed. And I know that I can count on you for your usual strong support. Data. We've known for a long time that IOM cannot remain uh, the leading uh, migration agency in the world if we don't do more about data. The statistics and data on migration are scattered around the world. The gaps are large and there are many and we simply have to find a way to bring this together in a more coherent usable fashion so that you have a stronger evidence base for making your policies. We will leave on your desk I think either this afternoon or tomorrow some early, uh, some early uh, efforts in that direction. 
uh, I'm pleased to report that on the 1st of July, um, our uh, Director for International Cooperation and Partnerships and I were able officially to open the IOM Global Migration Data Analysis Center in Berlin. I particularly want to thank the government of the Federal Republic of Germany for having offered to host the center. It's exactly where it should be. It gets us inside the European Union amidst a major university network with a lot of uh, sort of partners there like uh, the Gallup World Poll, the Economics Intelligence Unit of The Economist magazine. We think with that kind of a partnership, we can come up with something that will really be helpful to each of you. Um, the center is already producing data that's being used by major media outlets and IOM officials worldwide. It's also already produced IOM Key Statistics 2011-2014, uh, which is an abstract from the forthcoming IOM Statistical Report. Um, media. We try to revitalize our media infrastructure. We've created finally our own television and radio studio in the headquarters of IOM, equipped for live broadcasting. Very modest, but nonetheless a beginning. It allows us to link up to tens of millions of people via live interviews with major news broadcasters. We've ramped up our efforts to train staff members in responding to media requests to be more media fluent. Our team has also brought attention to important migration issues, most notably migration and refugee situation in and around the Middle East and North Africa. And through our Missing Migrants Project, we've become the primary source of data on the death toll of migrants along the migratory routes. Results-based management planning and reporting in the IOM Project Handbook. This is part of our effort to improve how we plan and report on programs to ensure that these have a positive impact on beneficiaries and that they're delivering value for money for each of you and our other donors. We work on improvements to plan and report uh, in a better way, more targeted on results. And we're going to be using, therefore, the Migration Governance Framework to help focus our IOM work. And this means changes to the IOM Project Handbook, strengthening results-based approaches, encouraging use of the framework in, as we develop projects and programs. Finally, apologies, third, third point and finally I'll sit down, <clears throat> the future state of migration. I don't know where you are in your thinking about this, but are we at a defining moment? Or is this the new normal? Or are we on a transitional path to something, the form of which we don't yet know? It's very hard to say at this point. There's certainly no immediate ebbing of the migrant flows into Europe and other parts of the world. None of this is foreseen presently. I'll be going to Bangkok in about a week's time to, once again, a follow-up meeting on the migrant flows in the Andaman Sea and the Bay of Bengal. Uh, it's happening everywhere. While winter may bring uh, a brief respite in the numbers, this will certainly be temporary at best as the drivers of forced population movements remain. And at present, with no more negotiations uh, or political processes in place than we have, uh, there's nothing going to stop the plethora of conflicts stretched all across Africa and the Middle East. So an equally important challenge for us is that then to develop more robust, safe, legal and orderly channels for planned migration, for family reunification, student and humanitarian entry uh, uh, visas and more, dedicated integration programs. We're looking at the possibility of doing something in the area of integration because a lot of the things that are happening today are the result of lack of integration of migrants into the fabric of society. Uh, what more efforts can we make to combat xenophobia, racism and discrimination? How can we facilitate safe and orderly migration that benefits everyone? Development outcomes and so forth. Um, under the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, we're going to have to work very hard to ensure that in the interest of you and migrants, that IOM has some role 
in the review and implementation process. It's very unclear right now that we'll have any role, but we, we will look to you to support uh, the inclusion of IOM in that process over the next 15 years. Although no, no, no provisions in the agreement that defines who's going to do that. So we need to be included. Some of the events on the horizon. Next year is the 65th anniversary of IOM. I hope that you will share with us your ideas on how we might mark that, not in terms of a celebration so much as how can we use it to get across what we as an organization want to say about migration and migration's future. Um, let's look at how we can uh, use that occasion to advance uh, uh, better care of migrants. World Humanitarian Summit, we have been one of the most enthusiastic supporters from the beginning. The, the regional consultations, I think, didn't live up to their expectations, but the issues are still there and the meeting is still very, very important for us. And we will be present and we'll be working hard to make our contribution in your behalf to the World Humanitarian Summit. Habitat 3 in October, we are partners with UN Habitat and we'll be supporting that also, particularly in strengthening our camp management, camp coordination role in the UN system. International Dialogue on Migration. I think uh, what I would propose is that we uh, focus, uh, devote that IDM this year to examining in detail the implications and practicalities of the Sustainable Development Goals and their implementation. Fifth Global Chiefs of Mission meeting in September. This will be 165th anniversary activity. We'll have all our Chiefs of Mission here in Geneva. They'll be calling on you, their respective uh, countries that, uh, where they're accredited. It'll be an excellent opportunity for us to exchange with you uh, and to share our experiences and reflect on the state of migration. So let me conclude simply by saying that there's kind of an irony in the present state of uh, the world, a world that has made and continues to make enormous technological advances, referred to often as a new industrial revolution. But despite these advances, we seem unable somehow to bring human mobility into it in a fair and orderly and humane manner. I hope that um, the events of this past year and those that will follow will lead us somehow to a longer term vision with deeper reflections on whether our present out of date, very rigid migration policies, and this is true pretty much around the world, whether these, whether these policies are really serving national, regional and global interests. The demographic deficit that many developed countries face is not going to be conquer, conquered by a compassion deficit. We have to link up the humanitarian with the demographic and the economic need for skills at all levels. We haven't done due diligence on that. And so doing the right thing is going perhaps to prove to be the mark of leadership in the period ahead. Nevertheless, we've all got several serious challenges to face up to. I'm going to repeat these because I've said them before, but they need repetition. One is we've got to work together to change the currently toxic migration narrative in the public. Uh, migration has always been overwhelmingly positive, and yet it's become a very negative word. We've got to move to a historically more accurate uh, presentation of migration in our public discourse. It's going to take a lot of work. And to do that, we have to meet the other challenge that we have to recognize. You have populations in the global south that are doubling in the century. You have populations in the global north that are dwindling. And there's going to be inexorable, uh, I think, more multicultural, multi-ethnic, and multi-religious societies. But it takes political courage to explain that to our publics uh, and to ask them for support on it so that they will understand exactly what is at foot. So in view of an aging global north in need of skills at all, uh, workers at all skill levels and a youthful global south with people desperately seeking work, 
uh, the result, I think, is fairly obvious. We have to prepare uh, for the change in our societies. And to do this, we're going to have to come to grips with several paradoxes. Paradox between national sovereignty and individual aspiration, and between national security and human security. So I'm looking forward to continuing the discussion with you on this. Thank you for your patience and my apologies for the length. Thank you.